Hi everyone, in this tutorial we will see the k-means clustering method. So what is clustering? It is a technique to automatically find groups or clusters within data. So the clusters in general are groups of data points that are similar among them according to some specific predefined criteria. So the main difference between clustering and classification is that in clustering, we do not have labels as we used to have in the classification setup, right? So we don't have a training set. We need to figure out a way of classifying or cluster the data without using any label information. So this is why clustering is considered an unsupervised learning method. Here are some examples. We can run a clustering algorithm to cluster regions in a map according to some criteria. For example, eco regions, some to some like a geographic criteria, right? So we can see here that the color would indicate the membership to the group and they are not necessarily right next to each other, but are similar to some geographic specific feature. For example, distribution of ecology or the family of plants that are available, for example. So we can also cluster graph data. Today, it, we have social networks and uh, every person could be a node in the graph and every graph connection could indicate that we are friends in the network. And then if we run a clustering method, we can find group of friends that share some common interests or using different information like uh, profile data or the activities we usually do in the social network, right? We can also cluster documents. Let's say we have a bunch of hundreds of thousands of documents without any classification, and then we want to group them by topic. We could cluster them, and then hopefully we find that on every group or clusters of documents, they share kind of the same topic, right? For example, one cluster could be all the documents talking about politics, or another cluster could be all the documents talking about sports. Clustering is also used in genomics. It's like if you have like a bunch of genomic data and you want to group the genes that are performing similar functions, then we can run a clustering algorithm over the vector that represents the genes. Also, clustering is used for astronomy. We could run clustering algorithms to find groups or clusters of galaxies, and we can later identify them in an image like here. Right? We can see that this is one cluster of galaxies, for example. Another very interesting application of clustering could be to learn new or different representations of more complex data. Let's say we have time series data, like here, where every single data entry is one full time series. Then they run on different time frames and using a vector that represents the value of the time series over time is not the best idea since they couldn't be directly compared. So one option to take all these time series and move them to a similar space, we could run a clustering algorithm that tries to group pieces of time series that share common patterns of variability, for example. So later, every single time series could be written as a linear combination of the time series that are the representers or centroids of each of the cluster. So at the end, the center of each cluster could be seen as a template or a mother piece of time series that it is the best piece of time series to represent that given group. So later, we could approximate every time series as a combination of these templates, such that the coefficients of that combination could be used as the new representation for each time series. The good thing here is that now every time series would be represented as a vector of the same length, right? Initially, time series could be of different lengths, and that's complicated for most of the machine learning algorithms. But if we run a clustering to find these templates and later to write every time series as a combination of those templates, then again, the weights of that combination could be used as the new representation vector. And we would be playing with data entries that live in the same dimensional space. This is a more classical example from Bish's book in where we could use clustering methods to create color-based segmentation on images. Here is a more uh, clear example in where we could run clustering to actually segment the objects and later help downstream systems that could use this information to interact with those objects, understanding what pieces of the image belong to one object or another. And in general, this clustering methods needs to run over some sort of representation of the image. For example, it could be the color histogram or some texture features, right? 
So the k-means is one of the most common clustering algorithms. It is called k-means because it needs as input the number of clusters and usually referred as k. So in general, we're going to have to tell the algorithm how many clusters we want to find. Of course, in general, we don't know how many clusters we want to find, right? So this is kind of like a, a downside of the algorithm. Every cluster is represented by their respective centers or centroids. And in general, it is adapting on an iteration basis by updating the centers until convergence. Okay, so let's see one example. Let's say we want to run the k-mean clustering for this database of yellow points. So initially, we are going to generate randomly the initial centers. Here we are assuming that k equals 4. So we generate four random centers, as you can see here in the image. So the first step is giving those centers we should assign the group memberships, meaning that every data point is going to find what is the best centroid for them. In other words, the closest one, right? Assuming we are using Euclidean distance. So we can see that already the leftmost centroid already grow most of the points that are colored in purple. Right. So after we have the memberships, eventually among all the members, we can find a better centroid than the previous one. It's like before we had a boss in this team, but now we got new members. So eventually we might find a better boss. So we should choose the boss again. Right. This is why we should update the centroids. And we can see that the purple team got a better centroid, which is more centered located than the previous one. So it represents better the whole team. We can see before the green team had as a centroid this rightmost red point that was actually far from the group. But after they recalculate their new boss or new centroid, then they could find a much better representer for their team. Right. So after we update the centroids, maybe some guys would like to leave the group because they like better some of the centroids in the other groups and some guys will join our group, right? So we have a new distribution of bosses or centroids. Let the data points now to choose their new best centroid. So this is why we need to reassign the memberships here in the left side. And we can see already that for those new centroids, now the memberships changed. If we go back here, the yellow team here. We can see that the centroid that had the yellow team had really few members in the bottom left center. But after the centroid is located here, now many data points from the purple team wants to join the yellow team. You can see that now the yellow team is much bigger and the purple team lost many members. And same thing with the green team, right? Many purple guys in the middle here moved to the green team. So now that we have new members, eventually we can find a better centroid or a better boss for our team, right? So this is why we need to update the centroids. And you can see that now the green team found a much better centroid. Same thing for the yellow team, right? The centroid moved to the center. So again, since the centroids changed, maybe some members would like to move to another team where they have a centroid that they like better. So some guys will leave the team and other guys will join our team, right? So we need to reassign the memberships and we can see here that still that the yellow team grew more. Same thing for the green team here. So since the memberships changed, now we need to move or update the centroids again. And we can see that, for example, in the purple team, they could find a better centroid that moved to a more centered position. The other centroids stayed in a very similar position, right? Still, they moved a little bit. So after the centroids moved, again, we need to update the memberships by letting some guys go to the teams where they found a better centroid and letting some guys join our team as well. And we can see that the green group got more members. But here now the purple team is grabbing more members from the upper side and losing members from the downside to the green team. So again, we update the centroids after these new memberships. And again, we update the memberships given the new centroids and we end up here. So visually, we can appreciate that the system or the algorithm converges to something that makes sense because this data, this, this is a toy data set and it's very clear what the groups should be, right? Here, we have another example, maybe a, a bit more realistic database, right? So we have this initial database of yellow points and we start by randomly generating five centroids, right? We are using here K equals five. 
five. So as you can see, they are in random positions at the beginning. And the first step is to assign the groups. So we can see that initially there's mostly two groups. There's actually a third group that is, that is just one point here. I don't know if you can see it, it's an orange point. Then after we update the centers, this orange point here becomes the only center because it's a group of one point. Right, so this is why we see the, the next center here. Then there is another center that converged to the same point. So these two points here stand on top of the orange point. So this is why we see this point here, right? And we just see four centers, but it's, there are five. But after we update the centers, then there is a reassignation of the memberships. And now we can see that already more orange points start joining the steam. And then we have a new group here of purple or pink colors in the leftmost side of the distribution. So after that, we start getting the more iterations. And then we see that more and more light purple points start appearing here. At the end of this set of iterations, we can see that we have mainly four big groups, but then a fifth group is created here with just one single point that is linked to this center standing in the bottom left side of the picture. So if we continue with the iterations, then we see that these groups start growing and we start getting these light blue points here as the fifth groups. So after several iterations, we converge to this clustering. Here is another example of a different distribution. Again, we have the yellow initial points and we start with the five centers. Here we see that randomly two centers fell in a really close position here. So that's why initially they basically get as group only this yellow point here in the middle right part of the distribution. And uh, after a few iterations, then the yellow points start increasing in this side associated with this center. And again, over more iterations, a new group will start appearing here in the bottom left part of the picture that are the brown points associated with this center here. So after several iterations, this actually is more or less like 35 iterations, we get this final distribution of five groups. So the pseudocode is, is really simple. Of course, we are going to implement this from scratch in Python, but now let's see the pseudocode. It is initially we generate k centers, right? Of course, they need to live within the range of the data. Then we assigned each data point to its closest center. So that's the membership part in point two. Then we update the positions of the centroids with the average over the data points that were assigned in step two. So uh, among the members, we choose the best centroid by calculating the average. And uh, then we go again to, to step two until all the centers stop moving. We're going to go over some details later. But if we are using Euclidean distance, then the average is exactly the centroid that minimizes the sum of the distance between every data point and itself. But if we use different distances, we're not going to be able to use the average to update the centroids. We're going to discuss that later.